Hi guys, really excited uh, to be here and talking about Crossplane and what we're doing um, in the Crossplane community and to kind of give you an update on our progress. Uh, this is the second community day, as Dan mentioned, and we're really excited to see everyone kind of show up for the second one. There are a lot of new uh, uh, faces here today. Half of the people attending today are new. Uh, and we're really, really excited to see this, the, all the progress and talk through everything that we're doing here. I wanted to kick it off by giving you some background on kind of what, why we created the Crossplane project and how we see it and its relationship to Kubernetes and, uh, and the cloud native ecosystem in general. So 2020 has been a challenging year in many ways, but one of the areas that could is a positive outcome from 2020 is that it brought into focus the importance of IT modernization. This is an effort that's fueled by the need to accelerate essentially the pace of innovation. Companies need to remain competitive in this cloud first world. When we talk to folks, we see a number of common themes and these, these should resonate uh, with, with you and your company. We see an increase, we see a desire to essentially increase developer productivity and self-service, reducing costs and improving cost predictability, supporting multiple environments. So this one comes up a lot, different vendors, different environments, hybrid, multi-cloud, potentially portability across some of these environments, enforcing security, having strong controls and policy and compliance, supporting legacy systems, which still exist today, and then finally, we hear a lot about people wanting to protect their investments and future proofing. Future proofing. Almost directionally, we see everyone head towards a cloud native ecosystem and open source. And so it might be worth kind of reviewing why there is a modernization effort that's underway at this point. In some ways, wasn't the cloud essentially supposed to solve all these problems for us? Essentially the promise of moving in all in on one cloud vendor, the cloud becomes essentially your exclusive platform. And then you're able to uh, you know, access all of it. I have access to infra uh, unlimited infrastructure, have access to all of it through an API. And essentially we have it all your controls and everything centralized in that space. We've also seen how, if you are following that approach that you, know, you can follow uh, DevOps practices, you can break down silos between operation teams and application teams, enabling self-service directly on the cloud platform itself. Um, this gave rise to movements like infrastructure as code, which we'll be covering today. Um, the, the idea being that you can actually create reproducible and declarative configurations and templates that uh, your teams can deploy directly on the cloud platforms. But in reality, what we're seeing is things are quite more complex. Cloud platforms are, are quite complex systems. It is in many organizations an anti-pattern to give developers access directly to the cloud. Um, there's a, it's a very large surface area of things that they can get wrong, getting security correctly, getting uh, cost, ensuring that they stay within cost constraints, all of those things become more complicated. And so we see this desire of companies to essentially create guardrails on top of cloud. We also see a push towards hybrid and multi-cloud. And you know, if you follow what the cloud vendors are doing in the space, that's becoming more real every day. And so by move, if you if you are essentially using multiple environments, then the platform line shifts. It's no longer in one cloud vendor. The platform line now has to cross multiple vendors, including hybrid boundaries. And so all the centralization of controls and policy and security and everything else now has to span the different environments. And after that legacy systems and internal systems, and this becomes quite complicated. And so what we're seeing is essentially a, a, a shift, a shift towards, you know, essentially from a DevOps culture where people are accessing the cloud directly we're seeing the rise of platform teams. These are teams that are within organizations that essentially offered a set of shared services that hide the complexities of the backend infrastructure and sometimes are dealing directly with the cloud providers and with uh, you know, hybrid on-premise systems 
um, adding guardrails, supporting policy and controls. We see these teams forming within organizations that essentially create an internal catalog of well-known configurations that application developers should be able to use when they're accessing the backend infrastructure. Yet the teams that are doing this are using traditional approaches of scripting or even infrastructure as code and tooling. And we see a lot of ticket offs and ticketing systems and, um, and even some are building their own consoles to kind of hide the, hide the details of what's happening behind the scenes. And uh, more recently, we're seeing you know, Kubernetes emerge as a way of running platforms at, uh, within, within these teams as well. And so if you look at how platforms are built and scaled, we should look at the cloud providers themselves because they are the largest platforms in the world. And if we peek behind the scenes of a cloud provider, you'll see it's actually quite, a quite, quite a complicated system. Tens of thousands of employees and customers, hundreds of offerings, thousands of internal tools that are being used within the cloud providers. And obviously very stringent security compliance and SLAs. What the cloud providers have pioneered themselves is the use of control planes. This is a central piece in the heart of every cloud provider today. It's the piece that you talk to when you're provisioning a VM, when you request a bucket, everything goes through the control plane. It acts as a single point of entry to the cloud. It's the thing that's responsible for storing configuration, for starting lifecycle management and policy, for security, auditing, compliance, everything is centered around a control plane. And that is such a critical piece of building these platforms. Furthermore, cloud providers are essentially exposing all of their functionality through APIs. API is the common currency. It's the most interoperable approach. Every lets you use any tool, any framework, any language can layer on top of APIs. Even pipelines and GitOps and CICD layer nicely on top of APIs. Scripting and infrastructure as code are you know, essentially layer on top of that and consoles and CLI as well. And so by creating API contracts between teams, the cloud providers have scaled both internally and as we can see, it's scaled externally because the cloud provider, cloud platforms are actually quite used, you know, used everywhere these days. And so they provide these contracts provide high level of abstractions that hide the details of what's happening behind the scenes. When you ask for a bucket in uh, S3, a bucket is an abstraction on storage. It is not what's actually happening behind the scenes. These contracts are versionable and the teams can organize an, around these APIs. So that's essentially what motivated us to create Crossplane. We wanted to bring that same approach that has caused the cloud to become the largest platforms in the world, bring that to your organization, to the enterprise, to the open source community. We wanted platform teams to actually use control planes to unlock the next level of efficiency and productivity. And so Crossplane has two purposes, offers two primary functionalities. The first is it exposes a single universal API for the cloud. This is a Kubernetes style API. We'll talk through the details here that enables you to address infrastructure and services across multiple vendors and do that all with a very consistent API. And the second part essentially enables you to create your own platform API and do that without having to write code. You can expose your own catalog of services. You can capture your guardrails, configuration, automation, policy, all of that layers behind or lives behind the API line, all ready for your application teams to consume. So Crossplane is based on the Kubernetes control plane. I think when we look back five years from now, we will look back at Kubernetes. I think we will see that its true power is not just container orchestration. It's the fact that it's a framework for control planes. Kubernetes pioneered this model where you essentially use an API approach to manipulate documents, desired state in a document store. And then a set of asynchronous controllers are able to take that state and 
essentially reconcile it with uh, the real world. This approach has worked really, really well for Kubernetes um, in the container space, but it's actually widely applicable. And I'm honored to have the folks that actually created this and uh, part of our panel later on today with, with Joe, Brendan, Kelsey, and Brian kind of covering what the motivations are for, for, for uh, Kubernetes control plane. Kubernetes also offers a set of uh, shared services that could be used for people are writing these controllers. Authorization, admission control, audit logging, validation, essentially gives you a complete framework for authoring con controllers that are able to automate and expose functionality to your teams. And it has a very rich ecosystem of tools and solutions that are built around it. And so we built Crossplane on top of the Kubernetes control plane. One of the first things we wanted to address was how do we essentially bring uh, the uh, different resources exposed by the, these different vendors under the same roof, under the same control plan. So we invested in essentially creating a set of providers that bring the different resources and the different services offered by all the different vendors under the same Kubernetes style API. So we created the Crossplane resource model, which is an extension of the Kubernetes resource model. It supports cross resource references, standardizes on spec and status across the different implementations. It handles things like connection secrets and credentials, workload identity and external naming and lifecycle policies. That's all part of the Crossplane resource model. And it's what gives us this consistency across the different vendors when you're provisioning resources, say in GCP or in AWS, you get the same style of resources that you're able to uh, manage across both of them. And we worked with the different vendors to create an entire ecosystem that's uh, building these providers. So we worked with folks like AWS and Azure to generate cross-plane providers directly from the SDKs, their internal SDKs. Um, that enables us to actually make sure that it's those things are up to date and they cover the entire range of resources that they offer. We're also, we also realize that it's gonna take a while before we get every vendor to actually uh, implement native crossplane providers. And so we're, we're investing in wrapping Terraform providers, which enables us to actually turn every resource that's exposed by Terraform into an equivalent CRD and uh, with an equivalent controller on the crossplane side. We think with the combination of these approaches, in the next few months, we'll actually have full coverage of the ecosystem, all with a Kubernetes style API that's on top, that enables you to actually manage the entire ecosystem of resources and services. Today, we're happy to announce that uh, IBM Cloud and Equinix have joined uh, the Crossplane community. And uh, actually, in the last week, they've made their providers live. The next layer we invested in was a, a, what we call composition. This is the essentially the ability for you to create your own APIs. So we added, we have a concept of an XRD, which is similar to a CRD in that it exposes a common API contract that your developers can use, but its implementation is not a Go uh, controller written in Go code. It is a template that uh, essentially supports composing different resources that are part of that implementation. And so uh, a given XRD can have multiple implementations, multiple compositions. And today we support YAML style compositions, but we're also investing in uh, traditional programming language implementations, including TypeScript and Python, via the great work that's happening with the CDK uh, project from AWS. So what this enables you to do is create essentially a service catalog of uh, services that you are sanctioning within your environment, that you're able to define those as essentially a new APIs that have well-defined contracts on them, but also define the implementation of those without having to write full-fledged uh, you know, controller code. We believe this approach replaces the open service broker uh, approach, and we would recommend that you use that in every scenario that uh, you know, where you need to create your catalog of services. 
We also invested in creating essentially we're calling configurations and blueprints, which are full comprehensive platform configurations. So you can define things like, um, you know, RDS with the VPC, IAM roles, DB security groups, and put them all essentially all in a single composition that gets exposed as uh, you know, a new API type, my RDS for your environment. And this enables you to create fully reproducible environments made up of these XRDs, made up of policy, made up of configurations of your managed resources, all and package all of those in essentially a container that represents your platform. We, again, today we support uh, YAML based uh, configurations, but we're going to fully uh, support uh, traditional program languages as well. So you're able to create essentially platforms that are written in TypeScript or Python. Um, you'll see some of this today. We have great talks today that show some of where we're going with this. And of course, there's a registry that contains uh, essentially a set of reference platforms and, conf and configurations for them. And these are, this registry is, contains both the providers and the configurations. And we think that there's going to be 20 to 30 of these reference platforms in the next six months that uh, cover a wide range of scenarios from microservices to serverless, to virtual machine workloads and AI and ML. Uh, Cheryl Hung from the CNCF will be here to talk about an effort that we're doing there to actually standardize on some of these uh, reference platforms and have them uh, be defined and certified by, by the CNCF as well. And so we've been making a ton of progress uh, in CrossPin. It's now two years old. Uh, I remember two years ago when we launched it at uh, uh, what now feels like an odd concept, but a, a, a live conference uh, in KubeCon Seattle. Since then, the project taken, has taken off. We are now at 10 million container pulls. We have more than 3,300 stars on GitHub across the organization. And we have quite an active Slack and, and Twitter community around us. The project is being deployed in production by a number of companies and now supported by a number of vendors uh, in the ecosystem and is being contributed to by a number of uh, different ecosystem partners and, and vendors as well. We're so excited to have to see all this momentum around the project and can't believe we got here in, in just two years. It's, it's thank you for everyone that, that's involved for this. And today I'm happy to announce that we're actually uh, just released Crosspoint 1.0. This is a massive milestone. The, as I mentioned, the project is being used in production by a number of companies, but today we are moving it to stable and we believe it's ready to be deployed in production in every organization out there. Um, major, major milestone, super excited and super thankful for the community for making this happen. So from a roadmap, st roadmap standpoint, we're working eagerly to get full provider coverage. We have a number of uh, features that are coming up, including improving the user experience around composition, multi-language support, adding support for day two automations on our blueprints and configurations. We're investing heavily in uh, getting more support for Terraform and adding more support for rich support for workload identity and uh, building a lot more blueprints around, around our, our, our project. So finally, I wanna leave you with, it takes a village to get something like this to happen. And we're super thankful for the community effort here. Please join us. There is a easiest way to do that is join our Slack uh, or follow us on Twitter or come to our pro come to the project and use it. We're also happy to take contributions, whether it's updating documentation, or if you go to our GitHub site, there's a set of issues marked, marked for first time contributors on the project. We're happy to help definitely join our uh, Slack channel or join our dev channel on Slack as well. And so I wanna tell you just a bit, I'm, I'm also the CEO of Upbound and I'd like to tell you a bit about what we do at Upbound. We are the company behind Crossplane. We are focused on investing and growing the community 
and we're also here to help you adopt Crossplane in your journey to your modernization journey. We offer a, a product called Upbound Cloud. We'd love for you to try it out. It's on HTTPS Upbound.io. It's live today, and we host the register for uh, Crossplane as well. Obviously, I, you know, my team will be upset if I didn't tell you that we're uh, we're also hiring. And so, if you're uh, interested in working on something like Crossplane or Upbound, please join us. Here are some links here for this. And then that I want to end with saying thank you for coming to our community day and thank you for being part of this community. Uh, we're so excited. We have a fantastic talks and fantastic speakers coming up today that kind of show, you know, the power of using control planes in the enterprise.